Will he just see a social club? What will the Lord gaze upon when he looks at your Christianity? Those are questions you must ask yourselves because we are about to go home. And this is the kind of stuff that makes for five wise virgins. And if you are not out, you're qualifying in these streets for this. You are not going to make it. You don't have oil in your lamp. The other day, I had a dream of my car, my vehicle, out parked leaking oil i forgot to share it it was about two weeks ago when i got this vision i've been meaning to share it but it's been eluding me it was leaking oil it was a witchcraft spell the dream was very dark essentially people are trying to cause me to leak oil that is in my lamp when i saw that vision i low-key was happy because it confirmed that i have oil and that people are trying to spill it people are trying to spill it so i rather looked at it i looked at that vision as a cup half full instead of half empty because that's the thing about being a child of god you are perpetually examining yourself to see if you're in the faith so uh working out your own salvation with fear and trembling it comes as a nice handy confirmation when you get a dream where occult practitioners are trying to give you an oil leak when people are trying to give you an oil leak it says oh so that which i've been wondering if i'm okay in light of it looks like i'm good because here it is that people are trying to put a puncture in my oil gauge in my oil uh, filter, what is this? Contain whatever. I don't know cars. Okay. Mm. Well, there are people who are driving cars all together, everywhere, without oil at all. And I mean, a vehicle largely represents ministry in a dream. So people have been trying to drain the truth of God. I've also had many dreams where I have had relaxed hair. Now, relaxed hair is not the problem over here. I do, however, as a black woman with 4C hair, I have experience with relaxed hair it's fluffy it's flat it um it breaks easily and it doesn't grow as much right because of the chemicals and how whatever i just never had much success with relaxed hair but i do have a lot of success with with, with afro hair plus i like the girth of my natural hair it's thick right it's got volume it's got true glory right i'm not out hating on relaxed hair i'm just saying that i don't prefer it because it just has no body it doesn't have volume the way that natural fussy hair has or natural hair has and in my dreams i don't know how many times i have seen people out here throw relaxer on my afro as in squirted on my afro so as to straighten out my coils because that which i am doing here is apparently too bodied apparently my ministry is too bodied apparently i've got too much girth too much ink on the page too much of a thick textbook they would much rather have a pamphlet something paper light so people are trying to curse my depth and curse the importance not the importance sorry but the the weight of scripture in my content because they want me to bring forth a very fluffy namby pamby type christian message when we are living in so evil times that can nobody afford to be maintaining that kind of fluffy communique about what a person should be doing or how we ought to be because the times are evil and God is not going to find faith when he comes on the earth and we are trying to prepare people to come into the ark. So we need a full bodied message of repentance, warnings, admonitions, sending people out there to let them know, sending yourselves out there to let people know. That is the oil, is the oil, is the oil in your lamp. If not, yo, get it in there. And also then explaining what it means or what it makes for having oil in your lamp. What, 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 what you look like when you have oil in your lamp. It's imperative that that information be shared with people in the last days because there is a great apostasy happening and many people think that they are of God. Many will try to enter in on that last day and not be able. A lot of people will say, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name and in your name did many mighty miracles and in your name cast out demons. And God will tell them, depart from me, work of iniquity, I never knew you. He will tell them, like the church at Laodicea, that they are pitiable, barren, blind, poor, naked. He will rather say of them, even though they think they've arrived, that he does not know them. And so it's important for people to have a torch, a flashlight, shone on facets of their lives that are lacking. That it might be evident that not only are you leaking oil, but you are completely dry. Your oil tank is yawning and all the contents have been spilled that which you are presently doing is going to get burnt by the fire you are not bearing fruit you are not a true saint if you don't highlight these things to people how can they ever 
learn that they're not saved even though they make a profession of faith these people praise me with their lips but their hearts are far from me how will they ever come to that place but people have been trying to get me to have what would be the tantamount of reduced glory relaxed hair well it is an, an analogy that is of course um relatable to me because i have a thing about relaxed hair i don't like it it's flat all right uh so i'm not out here coming at relaxed hair in totality because of how i perceive re relaxed hair i get visions a lot of them where it is that i have literally people squirting relaxer on my hair to calm down my messages too extreme and it's basically a curse done to not make what i say that deep because they consider it deep or whatever except my angle here is not so much to achieve depth as i am attempting to achieve repentance in whomever will hearken but people just don't want to hear the truth because the truth albeit it's setting free is offensive and some just don't take it they literally just don't take it they are not prepared to write it out so those that hate truth indeed just like it is written in god's word in first timothy 4 that people in the last days will not be able to endure sound doctrine and having itching ears or they will gather for themselves a great number of teachers to teach them what their itching ears want to hear so when they listen to sound doctrine run away not only run away afflict the person speaking and then choose someone that's more light-hearted giving them a more you know chill message that's feel good well feel good is not going to take you to heaven what's going to take you to heaven is righteousness those are two different things feel good comes later you will feel good in heaven forever without ever having any ounce of bereavement in your bones ever again so if you are pursuing happiness like will smith get righteous and it will eventually come but here on this earth in this on this planet on this side this the the the, the pursuit of emotional contentment the pursuit of homeostasis in the heart is a chasing after the wind just like in the book of ecclesiastes to try and not be hurt to try and avoid pain by any means necessary is the very thing that's going to send you into the flames of hell because man not only a christian look it's written in god's word in the book of ecclesiastes that man is made for adversity whether or not you're born again but when you get saved worse off are you because the world hates disciples in this world you will have much trouble but take heart i've overcome the world yours is to build your your heart count the cost of being a disciple and prepare yourself from for a volume of afflictions and trust that the present sufferings are nothing in comparison to the future glory that you stand to gain basically stop trying to chase after less pain in your heart because in this world you are going to have much trouble but take heart you have you were, again god has overcome the world hope deferred makes the heart sick but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life christians are a persecuted conglomerate if anybody wants to live a life in godliness they will suffer persecution your life is going to be a painful life so stop trying to pursue happiness on earth as a christian just try to pursue contentment and the joy of the lord in his presence is fullness of joy the weeping endures for the night joy comes in the morning you will have a peace that transcends all understanding in the midst however of a lot of sorrow in the midst of calamity you're like the mona lisa you know that song mona lisa mona lisa they have named you you're like the lady with the mystery smile is it only because you're lonely they have named you for that mona lisa sadness in your smile or do you smile to tempt the lover mona lisa oh is this your way to hide a broken heart are you all my name mona lisa or just a cold and lonely lovely work of art yeah i of course messed up the lyrics there but the mona lisa is known for being both happy and sad just this frowning smiling portrait this work of art that captures both joy and sorrow that is the christian they are the mona lisa they're like that lady with that mystery smile is it only because they're lonely god has named them for that mona lisa sadness in their smile or do they smile to tempt the lover or do they smile to please the lord mona lisa or is this their way to hide their broken hearts he is close to the broken heart and he binds up their wounds 
are you uh, that part i forget it man are you warm are you real mona lisa or just a sad and lonely lovely work of art yeah we are sad broken bereft devastated and yet full of peace we have the joy of the lord which is transcendent and yet bereaved because of loss just like a severity of loss mark 10 god says that if anybody has left mothers fathers brothers fields homes you get my point for the sake of the kingdom of heaven they will gain in this world 100 fold over all that which they have lost with persecutions and in the next life eternal life i mean if you lose mothers fathers fields etc you are a sad and lonely lovely work of art but you have the joy of the lord because in his presence is fullness of joy so the pursuit of happiness you need to put it in a bad burner recognize that your joy will come in the midst of sorrow loss of it because the world hates disciples but they will be given you an ability to deal cope and also an anticipation of a future glory that you're going to gain and also a supernatural joy that cannot be overwhelmed a stillness a peace in you that cannot be overwhelmed so people can't pull the rug from underneath your feet successfully even though they want to walk all over you like a doormat you are nonetheless going to have that lady with the mystery smile is it only because you're lonely they have named you for that mona lisa sadness in your smile you have a smile but you're sad okay unless you're prepared to take being a mona lisa in your stride and not just the flat out ch happy chappy grinning person 24 hours a day you can't enter the kingdom of heaven it is an accounting of the cost of being a disciple you must anticipate nightmarish sorrow right next to tranquility and peace chill and contentment the nightmarish sorrow is the thing that people keep on trying to avoid and so they keep on settling they throw in the towel they give up they take whatever they can reprieve anything that'll give them leg room stretching anything that'll loosen the brassiere or the corset around their waist that they might breathe easier they will take it because pain is uncomfortable but god warned you in this world you will have much trouble but take heart you have you, i have overcome the world absent of you embracing the mona lisa smile in your stride you can't be a christian you can't have your bread buttered on both sides your best life now is ungodly that joel osteen book it's not of god you are you don't have your best life now it's coming it's in eternity but god does guarantee you comfort here on earth but the comfort is in the midst of sorrow it's like being pampered that you're gonna see your dead son again in heaven you are still bereaved you're still mournful that he died in a biking accident but he was a born again child of the living god so you are comforted by the future glory that you stand to gain that is the joy of the christian you have bereavement and sorrow but in it there is a tranquility a peace a rest because god awards it to whomever will give him their lives so stop pursuing happiness i hope that that like proper if you if anybody were to listen to just that one sentence without the context i just gave they'd be like yo this chick is such a naysayer she's so sorry sa 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 sappy sold um i wish she wasn't so sappy sold but yeah no stop pursuing happiness on earth it's coming but you are not going to be just 24 hours bereft you all know that that's true with me some days i come here and there is no smile on my face altogether in my ministry but other days i'm singing other days i'm laughing at the top of my voice in the midst of all of this unemployment all of this sorrow all of this disregard of my person i am the mona lisa that's how it is with christianity in the absence of you having that kind of oil in your lamp that kind of girth in your hair that kind of glory the glory of a woman is in her hair in your hair unless you've got that bushy afro for a general demeanor you are not going to be believable when you stand before a holy god trying to account for your life claiming that you are a child of god it's not about pleasuring yourself on earth it's about waiting for what comes later then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily your righteousness shall go before you the glory of the lord shall be your rear guard then you shall call and the lord will answer you shall cry there are the tears again and he will say here i am amen if you take 
away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as noonday and your gloom be as noonday. There it is, Mona Lisa smile and the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a water garden like a spring of water whose waters do not fail and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt and you shall rise up the foundations of many generations you shall be called the repairer of the breach the restorer of streets to dwell in goosebumps if you turn back your foot from the sabbath from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the sabbath a delight and the holy day of the lord honorable if you honor it not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or or talking idly then you shall take delight in the lord and i will make you ride on the heights of the earth I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That is Isaiah 58. Meditate on that day and night that you might test yourself to see if you're in the faith. See what it is that it produces true answered prayer. Not that which is a compromise, a settle, a I'll take it because I'm presently afflicted. That which is a I waited like I did like those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength wait month up with wings like eagles run and not faint walk and not grow weary so when hope is deferred and your heart is sick Isaiah 40 31 then applies and after waiting for a little while this here becomes a reality this is when when then you are not eating because you are trying to plead or petition with God for answered prayer this is when he has your back when in other words Hannah when you're Hannah and somebody is deriding you she's full of insolent com com commentary against you she can't stop putting insult into your injuries salt on your open wounds when you don't repay evil for evil and also when in righteousness you 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 choose to you choose to draw near to god because of that realize that he was he's the one that is sovereign and omnipotent sufficiently to open that which he has closed in you, your womb. When you don't take matters into your own hands and deride back and show Penina where, you, where to get off smashing her with a pan on the head, when you rather take it to God in piety, that's when you start to see after suffering for a little while, the resurrection from a dead circumstance of your life issue whatever is the thing that's ransacking you i am being hotly pursued for suicide and as at recently i am being hotly pursued for perna donkey horse and donkey cow and chicken peach and pear unequal yoking i don't know how many times i have to lament against these men but the lord is faithful to award me understanding as to how it's going to end for them and how it's going to continue for me that i am not alone i keep hearing binaya ruel and fleury i know it hurts it's hard to breathe so to live sometimes these days basically it's like is anybody out there will you lead me to the light is anybody out there tell me is that it's gonna be all right you are not alone i am here the whole time singing you a song Ooh, i will carry you Ooh, i will carry you is anybody out there it's a secular song but it's so gospely that god uses it to help me understand whenever i feel like i am alone in this situation he tells me don't panic you're not alone he tells me there are more where they came from that are like you. Mona Lisa's with a precipitated to de unto death life, but that are able to bounce back and be all right tomorrow. And also that are waiting for some kind of thing to give. 
in a world of ravenous beasts trying to devour them whole, encircling them, trying to ascertain that they settle for whatever it is that the world is offering us. Because that's just the thing about Christians. The world has a bittersweet relationship with us in that they want what we have to offer. They, I mean, how can I, I describe this? Let me go back to first Samuel. It's like, the world is selfish with the body of Christ in a world that is so conceited and self-serving and so inward focused and with an external locus of control blaming everything and everyone instead of themselves for all the world's calamities a world like that when they meet with individuals that are being trained to be selfless like what is written in Isaiah 58 they want it for themselves they want to hoard it they want to put it in their backyard they tell themselves that if at all God was in my life, if at all Peter John was in my life, I'd be happy. Taking no cognizance at all for how Peter John would experience life under you. You are selfish. You are a taker. You are a narcissist. And so therefore you will drain as with the straw. Peter and John and Garabo. You are going to drain the child of God. But there is a selflessness and a magnanimity that dwells in Christians, that the world loves. The fact that we never mind turn the other cheek, but we let so much go. We let stuff go under the bridge that is water, very forgiving, and also very uh, biblical Christian about life. We are malleable, mushy, restable in, and so because of all that mush, people just want to bounce in us like we're, in, we're a sand castle. Not taking into consideration the weight of sorrow that they are on us. There is no reciprocity here. There is no exchange of pleasantries. There is only taking, taking, taking. So in an unequally yoked marriage, the Christian will always be the one burdened with righteousness. Because righteousness is excruciatingly burdensome when you are dealing with a wicked man or a wicked woman, when a person is evil beyond measure, it's hard to be godly because you have to keep on taking their nonsense without sinning. I endure that perpetually with my family and I fail a lot at it. I am constantly failing tests under my family because they're wicked and I am supposed to be better. I'm supposed to be bigger. So for me to be constantly afflicted like this under them is for me to be heavied by the burden of righteousness because it's rough to stay godly and not displease the lord not sin against them not have to go back and repent and say i apologize i saw that what i did there was wrong it's not nice to have to keep on doing that so Barana donkey and equal yoking will always weary the Christian out. But the world has, like I said, a bittersweet relationship with us. They like us. They also don't want God. So they're prepared to take him in us. Essentially, they deify us. They put us in their lives as little gods. Worship us instead of God. Because they want the benefits of godliness. Enough to want a godly person, but not God. Because like I said, we are loyal, trustworthy, mushy, comfortable to chill in like a jumping castle. We carry burdens, weights of people. We bounce back, we recover, we accommodate after being hurt, blah, blah. And with people being like yo-yos that keep on flashing and changing, shifting shadows, muting, mutating like a virus all up in our grow. We are then endured through some of the most horrific marriages if we are unequally yoked. Or friendships if we are unequally yoked. Or in my case, family relationships where you are subjugated to the tyranny of ungodly family members when you are unequally yoked. So it is irresponsible to throw yourself then into an unequally yoked marriage. But they want us because it's easier. 
to be with a Christian wife than with a worldly one. Because we are regulated by the Spirit of God and not so much by our own passions. There, there is a self-restraint that makes us handled already by God. So nobody has to put us in our place. No one has to neaten us up. So when then you want something that is going to be burdened by righteousness in your midst, it is of course then going to be the sorrow of that person when they are in constant flight from you. When they just run from sexual immorality, when they just run from unequal yoking, when they just run from a life of so much sorrow that it's going to be hard to please God because you're always bereft under your husband. When you are always fleeing from sin, the Lord will tell you at some point, be not afraid, you're not the only one. It's an army that's in flight here. It's a whole herd of animals in the wilderness. And they are galloping towards an inner city. And they are about to stampede every man, woman, child, car, building there. The Lord tends to gather the Lord tends to gather a whole chunk of his saints in one sitting. It's like he, he conscripts an army. It's like he enlists soldiers in an army in preparation for a battle. But the individual soldiers literally all come from different continents. And so by the time they go to war, they expect that they're going to be the only people on the battlefield only for them to find out that, yo, there are 10 soldiers from Brazil. There are 10 soldiers from Australia. There are 20 soldiers from Nigeria. Another 27 from uh, Sudan. Another 39 from Congo. Another 79 from Ghana. Another 27 from, Niger from, from what is this, Botswana. Another 30 from France. Another 50 from Portugal. Yeah, you will learn that those who are with you are more numerous than those who are with them. And when then your military your army your battalion is here that's when your confidence is suddenly going to skyrocket even though just yesterday you thought you were here yesterday you didn't you didn't see the other 70 soldiers from your own country never mind the cornucopia that are littered across the earth when you start to see those that are with you you relax because you realize that indeed the lord about uh, having told you in the run-up too that you are not alone was not just trying to comfort you with empty words he's God after all he can't lie but you had an issue with doubt but now that this thing is fruitioning there is now joy in the battle there is now joy in the war which is why I said in the beginning of this conversation I did not expect y'all to I did not expect y'all to out your dangle your hands and not pitch to the gunfight or the knife battle it is only fair that if you're going to fight me, that you bring your own weaponry, but I'm going to win. But the Lord has been giving me piecemeal understanding as to how I'm going to win. People have been beleaguering me on all sides, imagining that I am alone. People have been about me imaginative of the fact that I am out here clanking swords, quing, 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 with 20,000 people in a gun battle like I'm Uma Thurman and Kill Bill out here trying to get at Oren Ishii. They think that I am the only soldier here. And indeed for a season I was. But a time is coming. And that's what I'm here to prophesy concerning. Because me I be getting dreams, do you understand? But let's first finish reading from the book of Hannah. Not Hannah, 1 Samuel. There is no book in the scriptures named after a woman. And I spoke about that the other day. So Basadi Baheshang to preach that have no regard for the fact that God has made it evident that his chosen um, preachers and teachers are patriarchal. They're men. Up to you. Political correctness. There's no place for it in the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Yeah. No, no place at all. Years ago, I was reading uh, an article about how it is that there was an attempt to create a a gender neutral or a politically correct Bible that would put in quote unquote marks everywhere where there was the word man, they would put quote marks next to woe. Like next to man, the word woe. Like in brackets to say woman. Right? Like, yeah, God created man in his image and then they would put like inverted commas 
or a, a square brackets that said God created woe a woman or a man in his own image just to make the Bible a lot more politically correct and when I was reading this article this this author was responsible in stating that like literally Christianity God his order for things was never intended to be politically correct it's man in his own image therefore uh, 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 the Lord created man in his own image mankind man and like you get my point all that jazz like they were trying to just politically correct the Bible and this author was was arguing that God is equal like he considers us equal as men and women it's egalitarian like that but he has clearly chosen the patriarch as leaders on earth hence why man is the general term for human race at all because man was created first and if you don't want if you if, if you're picking a bone with that if you got qualms with it get out if you got like papa there are certain things that are just so cast in stone so black and white that if you've got bones to pick with it because you're changing your fluid god is immutable he's not a man that he should lie top of that he can't change right he's the same yesterday tomorrow and forever so if you change your mind you go you leave goodbye you're the one here that has left the party you don't gotta stay when you regard the rest of us as bigots and if in our bigotry we are apparently suffocated by the tyranny of the toxic masculine thing or the misogynistic fever of jesus or the misogynistic fever of god run with your sacrilege and your blasphemy let it be thrown out of the water later on when you get judged but as for me and my house we're gonna serve the god who created man in his own image because of course there are women are in there too so in the same spirit anybody at all that has a bone to pick with why god would leave a woman suffering for so long because you're just a woman garabo what kind of a god would do that to his own child what kind of a god would leave you out on a limb like that what kind of a god would have no regard for the fact that you're struggling what kind of a what kind of a what kind of a i mean if the lord has explained himself to you in the bible and if he's explained what it means to be a disciple and you're still picking bones with that you're stubborn you're rebellious you are disinterested in learning truth you have your own agenda and you want to impose it on god and seeing as it's written in god's word that if god was hungry he wouldn't tell you and that our god is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases and that his thoughts are not our thoughts his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are higher than ours and if at all nebuchadnezzar could also get to a point after coming up from eating grass for seven years and say the nations of this world are accounted as nothing before emmanuel no one can say to him what have you done if the pottery cannot say to the potter what have you done you don't get to rock up and question the striving of a disciple in order to enter heaven and claim that it is a harsh and servile god that is out you just making life really hard to enter heaven and so therefore setting human right humankind up for failure when you pick a bone with that fine be on the broad road that leads to destruction that many enter into and allow those of us that are happy to go and buy that precious pearl of great price and strive to enter in for many on that last day will try to and they and not be able stay on the narrow road that leads to life that few people find because we have seen that who neglects so great a salvation largely because we have also seen that none of us do good no not one for all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god so yes we have to audition quite horrifically to enter heaven and if you don't want to do it stay on the broad road if god was hungry he would not tell you like proper that's just the way that it is and so when people look at me and they say and they try to convince me to walk away from god to abandon the cross to take my hand off the plow i'm like you did that you feel like god owes you a job you feel like god owes you a car and a bit of family and a husband and some kids by the time your womb turns geriatric you've already had all your seven children you feel like the lord owes you everything you asked in prayer and that it is within your prerogative to grumble when you don't get it you are the one that treat god 
like a spoiled brat child that Archer is throwing his toys or her toys out the cot when mom and dad don't buy them a car for their 18th birthday after getting their driver's license. You feel that way, but I don't because I'm quite happy to be servile, to be, sorry, uh, subservient. I am quite happy to be in servitude and submissive to a God that has given me basic instructions before leaving earth and said, take them or leave them. I have come before you and given you blessings and curses, Garabo, life and death, Garabo, therefore choose life. And I chose life. I just chose to believe. I chose not to go to hell. And I chose to accept that he said that if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to suffer persecution. You're going to go through hell on earth. The world is going to hate you. You're going to be thrown at the synagogues. You are going to be dealt a bad blow. And no, it will not matter if you're a man or a woman. Because you are going to endure rubbish. You are going to be subjugated to the tyranny. You're going to be subject and subjugated under the tyranny of ridiculous men and ridiculous women that are going to feel entitled to you. And in the midst of this, you have to hold on to me and not think in a worldly fashion about how it is. The way that we think in this world. I mean, no, she's a woman. Please, she can't be left out on a limb. You know how bad these men can get. You know what rape culture is actually proliferating. You know how dangerous it is in these streets of Johannesburg. Everything is just painful in 2024. So protect our girls. Yeah, the Lord does protect girls. He protects boys too. The Lord protects everybody, but he makes it clear that if you're going to live a life in him, you're going to suffer persecution. You are going to be reviled. You are going to be disregarded. Whether or not you're a man or a woman is going to be ignored. As a man, your inability to provide is going to be disregarded by a society that is going to know that it's really rough when a man can't provide. And yet it's going to throw him into poverty. And then as a woman, they're going to make her turn 40 without children and without marriage, knowing that it's really hard to be a spinster at that age and be believable as anything at all that is apparently blessed. And God will put you at 40 as a spinster, as a woman, and he will make you poor at 40 as a man, knowing just how rough it is and how your life is just going to be so completely ignored, precisely because you're a broke man. But none such man or none such woman has a has a an excuse when they reject God because how could you leave me poor as a man you know I'm a man how am I supposed to find a wife when I ain't got no money and then ditch God he is without excuse similarly too you know I'm a woman how you how you gonna leave me get to 40 with no children and no husband and leave God no excuse so people who pick a bone with God y'all I'm sorry <laughs> it's basic if God was hungry he wouldn't tell you I'll I'll take what he's offering yeah, sometimes it's just a matter of humbling yourself before a God that has given you basic instructions before leaving Earth Bible. He's told you how to live in Him. And whatever questions you have for Him, you'll see Him later. Bottom line is He's the only way, way to heaven. And if you don't want it, fine. Take hell. I'm not going to argue with God. It's literally that basic. Like, I just, I'll take Him. I'll keep Him. I'll keep Him. Because at least He was wise sufficiently to help me understand what my life would be like once I come to him. Unjelile that a life in Christ is frankly impossible on earth. But that which is impossible with man is possible with God. So I'm living an impossible life and nobody's gonna make me walk away. Because like I said, I respect that God doesn't have to tell me when he's hungry. I respect that. I don't feel entitled to learning it. I don't feel entitled to him telling me what his thoughts are, what his ways are that are above mine. I am happy with that which he's given me in the Bible. I'm cool. I'm content with what little he has given me. So deride me all day. Let's continue to read then from the book of 1 Samuel. I told you I would piece all these things together. As Hannah continued praying, this is 1 Samuel 12. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved. And her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. The very thing I was speaking about. Whenever people are in deep sorrow, they're always assumed irresponsible. Whenever people are going through mass sorrow, they're always regarded as the ones here that are wrong. Remember that woman in the US that was shot dead by some police officers 
for basically rebuking a man in the name of Jesus. I think her surname was Massey. I forgot the name, her first name. She was killed for rebuking a man in the name of Christ because he was rude to her. The police that responded to her were rude because they were, I believe, racist or whatever, and they killed her. When you are in distress as a person, and so therefore in a position to receive assistance, Sometimes the world will treat you like trash precisely because you need help. And I have experienced that for a decade. And many people in the world are experiencing that. The body of Christ, the true body of Christ across the planet is experiencing that. And I can vouch for how painful it is to be honest, innocent, and yet treated like a criminal. That's chugging. I can vouch for the sorrow of knowing yourself that you're not the kind of person to do certain things needing assistance however and also knowing how responsible you are like when it comes to a job for instance when i was still employed i was reliable to my organization i was reliable to my boss sorry i was leaned on and trusted my boss used to give me new staff to train whenever they would start working um also i was respected by colleagues for my craft in the sense that they regarded me as a good project slash pro program manager also if anybody at all wanted to interview me they interviewed me on the grounds premises that they were taking somebody on board that they needed that would then hit the ground running that would highly unlikely disappoint i got a call from multi-choice to interview with them when i was working at m10 i, I declined the interview because i didn't want to work for a um a broadcasting like a streaming at any entertainment any company that has to do with the entertainment industry i did not want to work for because it was just against my principles but when multi-choice called me they were calling me on the grounds or on the basis that i would likely because i'm coming from mt and probably be of some kind of value to them so i was well respected by the recruitment agent and like the whole nine all right yeah i was basically a responsible employee i was always in the office i barely took leave i was never absent haphazardly the baba last nothing basically that you know someone that you can rely on you trust them that's my rap sheet that's who i am people know that that's who garabo is but i lost everything that's a whole nother story for another day if anything go back trudge through my youtube channel and find all those other videos from long twenty thousand years ago that explain what happened to my life and therefore piece it together right all that happened to me that which ha did happen and after everything happened to me now everybody that was trying to give me a job or anybody that was considering me for a job was suspicious of me so here is this person that comes from being reliable trustworthy leaned on called on to train other staff and respected upon being called for a job interview by agents and the like to a person that is being derided on the phone to just settle take what's coming you're lazy and a person that companies <laughs> sniffed around like like i was putrefied bread like opening a lunch box that belongs to someone else and before you can dig in there because you didn't prepare it yourself smelling it to see is this still edible yeah everybody opened me like an unfamiliar lunchbox and immediately just picked away at me i am good at what i do whatever i'm doing and i'm asking you to trust me when i say i was an excellent project slash program manager i was among the best when what happened to me happened one of my colleagues before i got suspended without cause a guy that was every so often in my projects but i didn't even really know him that much because my rooms were always so full of people some of whom that i didn't know personally 
he sent me an email even though he did not necessarily co um, correspond with me uniquely by himself but was always just cc'd in emails or present in my meetings as like a fly on the wall this man sent me an email after i got suspended and made to sit at home he sent me no not an email but a text message an sms on my staff phone found it on the active directory because next to our email addresses and our names were our company cell phone numbers because we worked for a telco company so our cell phone numbers were com mtn was a telco and our our working phones were cell phones because we worked for a telco so it was easy for him to find my number because on the day they suspended me they took away my laptop so i had only my work phone and this man went and found my cell phone number on the directory and sent me a text message from his own phone saying you are the best project manager in your entire department don't give up they did you dirty so what i'm trying to explain to you is that i'm good at what i do whatever i'm doing i was not ever mediocre i was excellent and yet today people pick at me like the way that a child picks away at collard greens or at broccoli or at cauliflower or at cabbage on a plate out here suspecting it and when they do ultimately interact with me when they do ultimately interact with me in spite of my eloquence how articulate i am in spite of how basically i can speak for myself my skills and what i am promising i can achieve or deliver they take it with a pinch of salt i am apparently all work and no action all talk sort and no action i'm apparently just here just a running mill going 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 but when it comes to lazy i'm here i am treated like i'm untrustworthy unreliable that even though i can speak i can't deliver and this is not based off of what they've experienced of me but by mere virtue of my present unemployment just by mere virtue of me being nowhere and having had this ridiculous gap in my cv my gap has not always been 10 years long there was a time when it was just six months fresh there was a time when it was four months fresh there was a time when it was a month fresh and yet because of my unemployment and how i lost my job i have been getting picked away at like broccoli on a plate by a child and everybody that has spoken to me including recruitment agents have been suspicious of me others to the extreme of rudeness because i got fired without cause the value of a reputation is like silver and gold according to the scriptures and mine was just ripped from underneath my feet and now you can imagine if at all i am being disrespected just six months after losing my job by recruitment agents how much worse is my life now in 2024 people ha happen upon my content my ministry they listen to me from start to finish sometimes i have series so i can have part one two three to ten okay i can speak y'all know i am loquacious in spite of how articulate i am studious scriptural in spite of also the proof that is in the pudding which is a persecuted life lived in front of you just by mere virtue of being a person trudging through a, a, a sorrow a forest i am in pain i'm in sorrow i'm in suffering i i have lack in my life i am struggling okay just by mere virtue of being a struggling soul i am being picked away at my content like cabbage on a plate by a six-year-old child it is sorrowful to observe that given that this here is not the application of a nine to five job in corporate south africa this is the gospel the work i do on youtube is ministry so people should be better receptive towards me or at least have a holier heart towards receiving me people should have a holier heart towards receiving my content in comparison to like somebody looking at my cv with a 10-year yawning gap in it it's different 
the recruitment agents and companies that looked at me like I stank. Even though I would have been a really excellent recruit if they brought me on board. They have some excuse because they're in the world. That's how people in the world are. When you are here rocking up disheveled on the street to a person that's cleanly shaven, smelling like aftershave. This person will likely be like, I don't have any money. So the recruitment agents and the companies look at me like I don't have any money. But when, when Christians or people that listen to Christian ministry receive me that way, because unlike other content creators, unlike healthy li lives, again, healthy lifestyles, healthy living Christians who are either monetized on YouTube or they've got a nine to five. And so this is like their side thing that they're doing. Christians that are here who don't have the kinds of trudgings that I've got through forests. They are received well as they ought because we ought to receive the body of Christ well. The Bible says that if you receive a prophet, you will receive a prophet's reward. If you receive a righteous person, you will receive a righteous person's reward. So believers ought to receive believers well. But there is a worldly reception by the body of Christ of suffering saints online. And I have seen it not only on my channel, but anybody else that has what is called a sob story online that is a Christian. Yes, like it. The world receives them the very way that the world receives the world when the world is disheveled. It's carnal. It's not successful fasting. It is not acceptable holy fasting in the sight of God. The, the world of people around me that are supposed to be Christian are looking at me, smelling me around and picking me like, cauli like cauliflower on a child's plate. But coming from a vantage point of being Christian, they suspect me. How? Because unlike me being fired without cause and people thinking I've got a sob story on my CV that had now has a 10 year gap in it. I can understand how a recruitment agent or even a company can think I'm lackluster. I'm lazy or I keep dropping the ball or I'm in, I keep insubordinating or I'm just, I might speak for myself and basically just like look good in certain parts of my paper, but mm -mm, I'm not willing to take the risk. Because I've been reviled. My reputation has been ransacked. But when Jesus says in this world you will have much trouble but take out of overcome the world. When he says that in this, uh, if anybody wants to live a life in Christ they will suffer persecutions. And when he says that when some come to Christ they lose homes, fields, mothers, fathers, brothers. When, when the Bible is yawning confirmation of what a persecuted life looks like. And you happen upon one. And you treat it like a hostile the way that corporate south africa has treated me like a hostile because of what mtn did to me all those years ago you on that day are displaying and so treating me like a hostile that you have never known god that you've never perused the scriptures that you've never part that you've never given true fasting true praying that you have never truly understood that we are people of a different status set apart cut apart the world hates us we are on a narrow road that leads to life that few people find we are not many and so like the early church, we have to band together and have each other's backs. You have not recognized those things. You have not seen them. You have not seen that it is inappropriate to respond in your church to the struggling old lady and the orphaned teenager. Like they're like in an underestimated capacity because of their sufferings versus the wealthy couple that is always donating whole entire buildings to the church when you treat it was like that for me at um emmanuel baptist and i i find it strange that they used to treat me like some orphaned teenager because i wasn't that thing i was actually quite prolific but you see i have i had a humble demeanor about me like i didn't show that uh, that's just the thing about black people you will never know that you're dealing with a doctor or an, an academic or somebody that is uh, very uh, successful financially and uh, like well put together you will never know unless you find out because you know the world tends to see one black person and they think they've seen them all you see a black person and you just assume that ah whatever nothing much until she's like i'm dr shabalala i'm dr Trongwani. until this person 
like drives into the church with like a big fat chunky BMW, then only you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa what do you do exactly? But when, when you rock up just plain faced out here, you know, rocking church attire on Sunday in your small little master too, nobody really knows, can tell just how prolific you were. Like my pastor, one of them came to my job where I worked to talk about some other parishioner and he was shuffling around because of the way that I, I am when I'm, I'm at work, you know, quite, quite a little bit of a look, like a corporate look. And when he saw me in my office and not so much my Sunday best, when he saw me in my office best instead of my Sunday best, he was suddenly not as, I can't really say chummy, but casual with me. This time around, he looked outwardly intimidated by me when he saw me at the office. When he came, go officing and spoke with me at the parking lot. I, I remember just thinking in my mind, why is this guy acting like this? Because in church on Sunday, he's a lot more chill. And ever since then, he was never really chill because he learned that I am a young, quite successful professional in my working space. Like, yeah, type set setup thing. There also was a guy at my church that used to work at MTN that got to learn what I am. And so then also changed his attitude towards me. Whereas before I was just a sweet new black girl that is just, huh, how are you? What's your name? And then at some point he became, hi, Karabo. Right? Yeah, people should not be like that in churches. You should not be treating a person differently based on what status you gauge them to be. You should be treating people based on your adoration of them. So, go get again. Before everybody got to know who I am and also got to see where I lived, because I once had Bible study at my mom's house, before they got to see my socioeconomic situation, essentially, I was just an ignorable black girl. To a point where there was this one Indian lady and an older lady. We had a young adults ministry. She used to like just talking to everybody. And um, one time she invited all the young adults to her house for Bible study. And this woman, every time I would speak, she would like, but like quickly just rebuff me. Like she would just jump over me, like just jump over me and choose to rather speak to the, the white girl next to me or the dude or whatever. She liked everybody else because she I assumed them affluent and me lowly for no other reason than the fact that I was black. She, she, she attached to me uh, less importance. She imagined that by get, giving me too much attention, she would essentially be plunging her own stats and not proliferating her own agenda. So even though I wanted to fellowship with her, I saw that she had biases based on her perceived lowliness of my person. Until it got displayed or proven later that I was anything but lowly. Yeah, that's how it was in my old church um and that's how it is presently on youtube i am a black woman and i'm suffering and when we struggle it is always assumed something gave of course she's lazy something gave of course she's worthless or she is lying or she is weak she's not good enough 